good to have you for another exciting installment of Chapter 11's discussion on liquids and intermolecular forces. In the last lecture, I talked to you about phase changes, viscosity, surface tension, and about a dude urinating in his tax returns. In this lecture, I'm going to teach you about heating curves and chemical equilibrium. With that said, by the power of Grayskull, let's get started. When ice is heated from negative 25 degrees Celsius at one atmosphere, you might imagine that its temperature starts to increase. It stays solid as long as its temperature remains below zero degrees Celsius. At zero degrees Celsius, however, the ice starts to melt. Because melting is an endothermic process, the ice stays at zero degrees C until all the ice has melted. You can see that shown in this diagram, which is called a heat curve. Once again, we're starting our ice at negative 25. Its temperature gradually raises, but this whole time it stays solid. Solid, 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 solid. As we're pumping heat, the temperature changes, but once it hits zero degrees Celsius, there is no temperature change. Instead, all of the heat energy is used to convert gradually the solid water into liquid water. Once that water is converted into a liquid, at that point, more heat pumped into the system will gradually raise the temperature of that now liquid water. Now, as the liquid water's temperature increases, it eventually gets to 100 degrees Celsius. In between this entire time, it's liquid. At 100 degrees Celsius, much like we saw at zero degrees Celsius, we start to see a phase change. The liquid water begins to boil. However, the temperature does not change. Right at 100 degrees Celsius, anytime we introduce more heat, all of that heat energy does not go toward raising the temperature. Instead, it goes toward converting the liquid water into gaseous water. That will continue to happen until all of the water has completely converted into gas. After that point, then additional heat energy will change the temperature of the now gaseous water. This figure, which depicts all of that, is called a heat curve and illustrates how the whole process unfolds. This takes us to two challenging problems that at first are going to look a little bit daunting, but hopefully I can clarify. In this one I ask, ethanol whose structure is given here melts at negative 114 and boils at 78. The enthalpy of fusion of ethanol is 5.02 kJs per mole, and its enthalpy of vaporization is 38.56 kJs per mole. The specific heats of solid and liquid ethanol are 0.97 joules per gram Kelvin and 2.3 joules per gram Kelvin respectively. Question A says, how much heat is required to convert 42 grams of ethanol at 35 degrees Celsius to the vapor phase at 78C? And question B asks, how much heat is required to convert the same amount of ethanol at negative 155 degrees C to the vapor phase at 78 degrees C? Now, I'm not going to answer this question here, but we'll post a link to a separate video in which I will. I admit that this question looks daunting, but hopefully after seeing the second video in which I show you how to do it, it will be a little bit less horrible. In this question I ask, if 42 kJs of heat is added to a 32 gram sample of liquid methane under one atmosphere of pressure at temperature of negative 170, as depicted in this cute little figure, what are the final state and temperature of the methane once the system equilibrates? Parenthetically, it says, assume no heat is lost. The surroundings and normal boiling point of methane is negative 161.5. The specific heats of liquid and gaseous methane are 3.48 and 2.22 joules per gram Kelvin, respectively. Like the previous problem, this problem, which also might look a little bit overwhelming, is not going to be solved here, but I will post a link to a separate video in which I answer it. Please feel free to click on it, watch it, and see if you can make sense of how to do this kind of problem. That takes us to another subject chemical equilibrium. When temperature is high enough, liquids gradually evaporate. Now, evaporation, of, of course, occurs when molecules at the surface of a liquid gain enough energy to overcome all of their intermolecular attractions to the other molecules around them in the liquid. They then get expelled and escape as gas molecules like this, which I've also shown you in a previous video. Now, this contrasts a little bit with the circumstance in which a liquid evaporates in a closed container. See, when that happens, molecules at the liquid surface spontaneously convert to gas molecules and fill up the space above the liquid inside the container, so there are gas molecules floating around up there. Eventually, that space gets saturated. In other words, it gets to the point where it can't hold any more gas molecules. Now, as this occurs, gas molecules collide with the liquid surface and then rejoin the liquid, becoming liquid particles again. In a closed container, then, the system eventually reaches a point where for every molecule that goes from liquid to gas, another molecule has to go back from gas to liquid. This state is called dynamic equilibrium. 
and is shown beautifully in this video produced by uh, University in Surrey. I like this video because it not only depicts clearly how dynamic equilibrium is established and how it works, but it also involves a narrator who has a cool British accent, which I'm not going to attempt to imitate. I highly recommend you click this link and watch this video, because it is cool. That takes us to the end of this video, so mischief managed. Please watch my next video in which I'll teach you about boiling point and vapor pressure. Until then, by the power of Grayskull, have an enjoyable rest of your day.